Ruby Volume 7 is, to date, the most ambitious and nuanced volume in the series. Because of that, it's harder for me to find individual scenes I liked. The stupid moments were really, really stupid, and the smart moments were often subtle and understated. But they were there. Over the last nine months since the volume ended, I've gone back and forth on whether this or Volume 4 are in that distant second place behind Volume 6. But whereas videos on those volumes were easy to outline, not so much here. There's going to be a lot of asterisks on a lot of these scenes. Even so, I did manage to wade through the mundanity, cringe, and brilliance to pick the 10 best scenes in Ruby Volume 7, with only one scene per episode and listing them in chronological order. The opening scene does a really good job at establishing the tone of the volume. This would work a lot better had we actually seen Atlas and Mantle before now, but it works fine. Weiss, Maria, and Crow have been to Atlas, and their reactions sell how off this is supposed to be. They also took complaints and praises from prior volumes to build an actual setting. Mantle is the first locale in the series to feel like an actual place with actual people with actual lives the heroes are going to have to protect. By the end of Volume 8, I'll probably get sick of it, but I'll take it over the randomly generated populace of Vale or the 2D cutouts of Mistral. For the second scene, Volume 7 feels like what Volume 5 should have been. They meet up with the Headmaster, they know something is off, they're empathetic, and all this sets up everything that'll happen later. For better or worse, Amity Coliseum, the election, the themes of trust, all of it is established here. It sets up a logical narrative through line for the volume, and it also helps that that through line is pretty good and that they do actually follow through on it, which is something they failed to do in Volume 5. Uspin spent god knows how many centuries burying the truth, suppressing religion, and keeping the peace in a way that allowed Salem to accumulate untold amounts of power uncontested. And Ironwood wants to, you know, actually do something proactive to stop her for once? Even the oversight and Ruby's failure to address that oversight are well implemented. Or they would be if not for a certain subplot that'll make up a large chunk of next week's video. For the third scene, I'm picking this one from episode 4 where Jacques confronts Ironwood. I'd say a phone call would have sufficed for him, but maybe they just couldn't get a signal out here. And if it was just a phone call, we wouldn't have gotten his interaction with Weiss. We wouldn't have gotten a moment for the only Blake ship that isn't completely toxic, and we wouldn't have gotten the most realistic scene in the series. For the fourth scene, even though the election allegory is really dumb when viewed as an allegory, the actual intensity of the scene is nothing to mock. It's actually nail-biting just waiting for things to go wrong. You're wondering if Watts is going to get away with it, it complements the Renora scene nicely, and then the lights go off and Tyrion starts slaughtering people to make Ironwood look bad. If not for the bit with Fiona, which honestly might make my worst list next week, then this would rank among my favorite scenes in the entire series. For the fifth scene, I'm picking this one in Ironwood's office. Tensions are high, Ironwood is weighing his options, which gives Ruby more reasons to fear his reaction to the truth. It's just a really tense situation with no real right answers, and a lot of things they can do to mess everything up. They're all putting considerable amounts of trust in each other, even if Ruby is still hiding things from Ironwood. And while he doesn't go full dictator yet, the possibility is there, and only being held back because of how much trust Ruby and her friends are putting in him. A trust Yang and Blake later betray for just asinine reasons. The sixth scene follows up on that. Ruby and Oscar finally agree to put the rest of their trust in Ironwood. He's nearly at a breaking point and needs to know that at this point Ruby and Oscar still trust him and are rewarding that trust. And while I'm on that subject, I actually love how Salem's immortality isn't really a factor in what ruins that trust. Why would it? They had their reasons to keep it a secret. Ironwood knows exactly what all this must look like to them. You can even make the argument that when things fall apart, it's because Ironwood doesn't trust Ruby's ability to save Mantle. And the reason he doesn't trust her abilities is because it was members of her team that leaked information to Robin which could have ruined everything. It's a clever bit of writing and one that makes Ironwood with the uncontested MVP of the volume. For the seventh scene, I want to highlight Tyrion and Watts' dynamic. Sadistic killer and stoic scientist is honestly a good combination I wish would pop up in more anime. They just have so much respect and admiration for each other's skill sets. 
I have way more reason to buy their camaraderie than half of the main cast. For the 8th scene, it's Watts vs. Ironwood. You all knew this was coming. I've probably gushed about this scene more times and for longer periods of time than any other fight scene in the series. It's right up there with Ruby vs. Torchwick from Volume 3, lots of cool shots, tons of pathos, great aesthetics, a decent song, a perfect matchup of personalities. It's one of the few fights that they actually care to fully map out, and it shows. This scene is so good that not even the stupid as hell reveal of Ironwood semblance can bring it down. The ninth scene on this list is Clover's death. Yes, it's a very well animated fight scene with some fun back and forth. It's very striking and pretty and makes for a good wallpaper. All of that would have easily cemented it onto this list. Given what else was in that episode, I'll take what I can get. But maybe I'm just a horrible person, but the backlash against this scene gives me life. It is absolutely hilarious how many people just assumed Clover and Crow were gay for each other because they talked like three times. It's hilarious that these people will still say that there's nothing indicating romance between Blake and Son. It's hilarious that these people projected their own relationships onto fictional characters whose sexuality was never even hinted. It's hilarious that they tried counting this as an example of burying your gaze. And it's hilarious because the story for the entire volume is so much better and so much more impactful with this death than it would be without. It. And while the final scene on this list can't hold a candle to most of the other scenes on this list, it still hits a bit different. Cinder is not a well-written villain. She's a second-rate Kylo Ren who himself is a second-rate Shigaraki, but I really like watching her fight. She's way more primal and powerful than anyone else we've seen in action. And by god, Jessica Negri actually became a good voice actor for a bit. And I refuse to start. That one line was enough to actually fill my head with everything they could have done sooner to make her one of the quintessential 21st century villains, but instead it's just a single line among a bunch of poorly written dialogue. So there's my list for the best scenes in Volume 7. What were your favorite moments? Comment below and let me know. Next week will be the worst list and that's gonna be a bit more of a doozy. I'm Mediocrity4, thanks for watching.